after yet another testing failure announced just last week. The Air Force now no longer intends to push its first hypersonic missile, the AGM-183 Arrow, into production. This marks a significant setback for America's efforts to close the perceived capability gap represented by Russian and Chinese hypersonic weapons already in service. And based on the evidence at hand, there's an argument to be made that political pressure to hurry up and get something hypersonic into service may be what broke the arrow. Let's dive into what really happened to the Air Force's arrow missile. I'm Alex Hollings. And this is Air Power. So over the past few years, we've talked a lot about hypersonics on this channel. And one of the bigger points I tried to get across in my work is that it's not really about who fields the first hypersonic missile or even who fields the fastest one. What really matters is who fields the most effective, capable, and reliable weapon systems that, and this is really important, fit within an overarching combat strategy and sound military doctrine. And based on the evidence at hand, at the time I argued that the U.S. appears to be less focused on winning the headline war and securing hypersonic prestige than it was in fielding the most effective and capable combat systems. And in my opinion, that's the right approach. But based on my dive into Arrow, it really does seem as though political pressure to close this capability gap forced, or maybe encouraged, the Air Force to keep pushing Arrow forward, despite the fact that the evidence was clear that this program needed more developmental time. But before we delve any deeper, I do want to offer this one disclaimer. And that's that while I do have evidence to substantiate my assertion that Arrow was being rushed into service, that's really all the evidence shows. It doesn't also clearly articulate the reasoning behind that rush. The idea that that rush was based on political, media, and popular pressure to get a hypersonic weapon into service is based on my own rationale, and I don't want to present present that as irrefutable fact. All right, disclaimers out of the way, let's dive into this. The AGM-183 Air Launched Rapid Response Weapon, or ARO, has seen seven publicly disclosed test launches since 2021, with four of those tests ending in complete failure. But while failures are par for the course during the development of new weapon systems, Arrow's testing woes came during portions of the testing regime that one really wouldn't expect issues. If Arrow had failed while trying to perform aggressive maneuvers at hypersonic speeds, that would make perfect sense. But instead, most of its failures came when it simply didn't separate from the launching aircraft, or its rocket motor just didn't ignite. In the tests where Arrow did separate effectively and ignite, it went on to perform just fine at hypersonic speeds. And these failures really point toward overarching issues with the Arrow program, both in terms of its intended goals and the rush to put it into service. Of course, this doesn't mark the end of America's hypersonic efforts, or even the Air Force's. They're now pivoting their focus to the scramjet-powered hypersonic attack cruise missile, or HACM, that's cruising towards service as soon as 2027. But there is a long list of other hypersonic programs following closely behind. At last count, the number was over 70. Now, despite Arrow's fate being sealed, the Air Force does still have two test models of the weapon left that it does intend to fire in follow-on tests. But these tests will really be for the benefit of future programs rather than efforts to mature Arrow itself toward a production contract that we now know isn't coming. But to really understand where Arrow went wrong, we've got to start all the way back at the beginning, when development started in August of 2018, which was just six months after Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a speech that many now see as the onset of today's hypersonic arms race. In the speech, Putin declared that Russia was placing the world's first two modern hypersonic weapons into service, and the KH-47M2 Kinzel and the Object 4202 or avant-garde nuclear hypersonic glide vehicle. Now, hypersonic weapons are often characterized as missiles that are capable of flying at speeds higher than Mach 5, but that's technically a misnomer. 
The truth is, missiles have been flying faster than Mach 5 for more than a half century now. In terms of sheer speed alone, ballistic missiles have been hypersonic pretty much since their very inception. With Germany's V-2 rockets reaching Mach 4.3 during their ascent and then exceeding Mach 5 during their descent as they closed with their targets. Since then, pretty much all ballistic missiles, rockets, and spacecraft have all achieved hypersonic speeds. In fact, even America's massive Cold War air-to-air -air missile, the AIM-54 Phoenix, was believed to be hypersonic if leveraged with a ballistic flight path toward the ground. If that sounds familiar, it's because that's basically what the Kinzel missile is today. And of all organizations, it was actually NASA who proposed doing this, launching the Phoenix from their F-15. But the program ultimately never went beyond mounting the Phoenix on an F-15 and taking some very cool pictures. Now, intercepting ballistic missiles moving at these speeds has long been a very daunting challenge, but it's one that many air defense systems around the world have demonstrated a knack for in the years since the first V-2s started flying. What made these new kinds of hypersonic weapons Putin was talking about so dangerous wasn't just their speed, but the addition of maneuverability while flying at those extreme speeds. Modern air defense systems intercept inbound hypersonic ballistic warheads by tracing their trajectory and then calculating the remainder of their flight path. The system then launches a missile of its own at a point in that predicted flight path to intercept the inbound missile, sort of like leading a receiver when throwing a football. Maneuverable hypersonic weapons render these calculations moot by changing course mid-flight, which at such high speeds makes calculating a new intercept all but impossible, especially if you change course more than once. Now, we would later learn that one of these two new hypersonic weapons was actually nothing more than an air-launched variant of the long-serving 9K720 Iskander short-range ballistic missile that had been fitted with a new air-to-ground guidance system that evidence suggests is packed full of American hardware. In other words, Kinzel is a hypersonic weapon in the same way the V-2 was 79 years ago. But the other weapon Putin disclosed, the Avant-Garde, really does appear to be a hypersonic glide vehicle in the truly modern sense. And with China's hypersonic anti-ship glide vehicle, the DFZF, starting testing as early as 2014, this speech was the point in which the U.S. had to recognize two distinct challenges posed by this new influx of maneuvering hypersonic weapons. The obvious first challenge was in terms of strategic capability, with Russia's avant-garde expected to be able to deliver nuclear warheads to American soil regardless of America's layered missile defenses, and China's DFZF aimed at eliminating the advantage American aircraft carriers provided in terms of force projection in the Pacific. But the second challenge these systems created was more notional. As the world's only remaining superpower since 1991, the U.S. has led the world in military technology for decades. But with these new systems in service for geopolitical rivals and no comparable weapons in the American arsenal, the Pentagon recognized that it would soon face significant political and media pressure to match these advanced capabilities. Of course, this creates problems because there's not much strategic value in directly matching these Russian and Chinese capabilities. America's ICBM and SLBM arsenals could already overcome Russian and Chinese missile defenses, and there are new ICBMs. ICBMs already in development. Likewise, the U.S. has no pressing need for a long-range anti-ship weapon for shore defense because the U.S. isn't laying an illegal claim to a vast swath of the Pacific Ocean like China. But it's important to understand just how powerful popular and political pressure can be in terms of weapon development programs. While the DOD may ultimately be the resident experts in what the U.S. needs for its own defense, it ultimately answers to sometimes hyperbolic lawmakers who don't have the same level of understanding. And ultimately, those lawmakers are the ones who dictate the budget. We've seen this song and dance time and time again, with branches requesting to cancel programs or retire platforms for the sake of future efforts, but lawmakers not allowing it, for political or economic or strategic reasons. So the DoD got to work, and before you know it, there were 70 new hypersonic programs drawing funds from the Pentagon's lines of accounting. Some were aimed at fielding similar hypersonic glide vehicles, or HGVs, to those Russia and China already had in service. 
Others were aimed at more technologically complex hypersonic cruise missiles that leverage scramjet propulsion, and a few even aimed at fielding fully reusable hypersonic aircraft for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions, as well as strike operations. But while many of these systems for the Air Force, Army, and Navy called for lengthy R&D efforts, one program appeared closest to fruition by 2020 the Air Force's Air Launched Rapid Response Weapon, or Aero. And it's not too hard to understand why the Air Force and the Pentagon would want to rush development on this weapon. It seemed technologically within reach, and it would serve as a pretty valid response to both hypersonic challenges, with its intended capability set potentially serving as an answer to threats posed by Russian and Chinese systems in service, and with an aggressive and rapid timeline, it could neuter arguments about America falling behind the hypersonic curve as it continued development on more technologically advanced and complex weapons. Because while Arrow would obviously offer some strategic value and unique capabilities, it wouldn't exactly be going towards a mission set that's currently gapped within the American arsenal. It would just do something America can already do, potentially a little bit better. But more importantly than that, I argue, that rapid timeline into service could appease lawmakers and the populace while the Pentagon continued work on more advanced and capable weapons that would take longer to get into service. So Lockheed Martin was awarded a contract to begin work on the AGM-183 Aero, with the intent of fielding an air-to-ground hypersonic glide vehicle, or HGV, capable of sustained speeds between Mach 6 and 8, with a range of just about a thousand miles. A lot of the specifics about the Aero specifications remain a bit murky, but we do know that it's a very large weapon, and as such, it's really intended to be carried by bombers. It's been carried by the B-52 throughout testing, and would later be incorporated into the B-1B, B-2, and B-21 if it had entered service. It also would likely be carried by some fighters, like the F-15E Strike Eagle, but again, because of its size, it would definitely never be carried internally by stealth fighters like the F-35. While Russia's avant-garde and China's DFZF are both considered strategic deterrents, or weapons that aren't meant to be used so much as to serve as technologically advanced sabers to rattle when geopolitically posturing, Arrow's conventional warhead was meant to make it part of America's conventional air power apparatus. In other words, while Russia and China sat on their hypersonic weapons, America wanted a missile it could use right away, providing some new combat capabilities, all while shifting the popular narrative surrounding hypersonics back into Uncle Sam's favor. And to that very end, the AGM-183 was classified as a Section 804 Rapid Prototyping Middle Tier of Acquisition Program, building off of previous progress made by DARPA in the HGV realm. In layman's terms, what this really means is that the Arrow was meant to make its way into service at practically hypersonic speeds. Now, as I mentioned at the top, the Pentagon has yet to offer any official explanation for the Arrow's failure, but you can find some strong evidence to back my assertion in a 412-page report published in January by the Office for the Director of Operational Test and Evaluation. Just about halfway through this very long document, you can find a scathing review of the Air Force's aero effort that suggests the weapon was not just being rushed into service too quickly, but that its rapid testing schedule wouldn't even allow for adequate data to be collected to prove that the weapon would really work. I'll quote the report here. Despite being under DOT&E oversight for over four years, the AGM-183A Air Launched Rapid Response Weapon Program Office does not have a DOT&E approved integrated master test plan, nor has the office submitted an operational demonstration plan, but is proceeding to test the Aero. The Aero program has not yet demonstrated the required warfighting capability. Within the three pages that this report dedicates to the AGM-183, you can find a number of prominent red flags. The DOT and office took particular issue with the Air Force's rapid approach to testing that seemed to be operating under the foregone conclusion that Arrow would function as advertised and just ease right into service without any considerable hiccups. I'll quote the report again. 
the limited number of planned flight hours and test assets will preclude an adequate assessment of all operational suitability metrics for the Aero system during this phase of testing. The report goes on to make a number of recommendations about Aero to the Air Force, including that the Air Force should deliver an adjudicated integrated master test plan, and that it should conduct an adequate survivability assessment of the Aero in a cyber-contested environment. And as this report clearly articulates, Aero did not have the trouble-free path to service that the Air Force seemed to expect. Arguably, because of that speed in which this program was pushed forward, it faced technical hurdles and portions of the testing regime that most programs might take for granted. The very first Aero flight test, which took place in April of 2021, went wrong when the missile just failed to separate from the launching aircraft. The second flight test, which happened in July of the same year, also failed after the missile separated from the aircraft and its rocket motor just didn't ignite. The third flight test, which was an all-up round or production-ready design, failed when, according to the report, low voltage caused a built-in test fault upon application of power, causing the weapon to prevent launch. In other words, all three of the Aero's failures to that point had all occurred before the missile's engine had even fired. While further details about these failures are admittedly sparse, it's hard to deny that this really looks like the result of rushing a troubled system into operational testing. As we've discussed at length in previous videos, the modern hypersonic arms race isn't really what it's been made out to be in popular media discourse. While the US, Russia, and China have all been rushing these new high-speed weapons into service, the weapons themselves demonstrate that each of these nations have very different finish lines in mind. While Russia views hypersonic weapons as a means to deter Western aggression with the threat of nuclear strikes, China's hypersonic efforts are really all an extension of its anti-access area denial strategy in the Pacific, and America's conventionally armed hypersonics, like the hypersonic attack cruise missile, are clearly aimed at neither of these goals but are instead focused on the ability to rapidly respond to a wide variety of potential threats anywhere on the globe. The truth is, the nation that fields the first hypersonic weapon will probably win the headline race, but the nation that fields the right ones, the most capable, cost-effective, reliable, and strategy-based ones may not win that headline race, but they may just win the next big war. Programs like the HACM, the Army and Navy's combined efforts on the conventional prompt strike weapon, the Air Force Research Lab's Mayhem program, and many others all seem as though they embrace that concept of fielding the right systems rather than just fielding a system for the sake of matching capabilities advertised by competitors. But Aero's failure and the shortcomings of its testing regime seem to suggest a different focus one that prioritized saving face and securing hypersonic prestige over the strategic or tactical value of the system itself. That's not to say that Arrow wouldn't have proven very handy in a 21st century fight, but by putting concerns about perception ahead of capability, the Air Force seemingly doomed Arrow to an early demise. It would seem, then, that the AGM-183 Arrow is a cautionary tale about the importance of keeping your eye on the strategic ball. Because when the focus of new weapon programs become appeasing the aggressive questioning of politicians or responding to hyperbolic headlines about a modern-day arms race, the result is always going to be a disappointment. But when it comes to placing blame for Arrow's failure, I find myself torn. It's not quite fair to blame Lockheed Martin for failing to deliver on what seems to be a far too aggressive timeline. It's not quite fair to blame the Air Force or the Pentagon when they were clearly being pressured by political power. And it's not quite fair to blame lawmakers when they have genuine concerns about American defense. But to give you my take, regardless of where you feel it's appropriate to place this blame, in my opinion, Blame shouldn't be the point at all. Yeah, money was wasted on the Aero program, but the data accumulated through Aero will certainly benefit future efforts. And that effort to field a capable and effective American defense is ultimately what this is all about. Aero's failure may give America's opponents the opportunity to gloat, and maybe they have every right to. But at the end of the day, the Air Force knew that canceling Aero would be a black eye. 
but it also knew that this weapon did not seem to have what it took to succeed, maybe because it didn't have the time or the resources to do so. But that decision to take a big bite of humble pie on America's behalf shows us that when it counts, the Air Force will fall on that grenade and prioritize capability and defense over how it's perceived by the media, by lawmakers, and even by the general public. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what I would ask it to do. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.